So I am pretty sure that these talks, I'm pretty sure that these talks that we had happened um, around May of 2017. So here's some more of that here, uh, where I ask him, I'm asking him a question now. Are you still not allowed to publicly talk about the documentary? I still like to get you on a public conference call one day, like what we did with Judy. So um, he says, I can talk. And I ask him, would you be willing to do a Q&A or discussions one Friday night? And he says, honestly, I'll chat some on the phone, but I have no desire to do a video recording. Uh, also, Hinnon needs to understand that no silence, no silencer was used. Look at the pics of the barrel. Look at the pics of the gun. Do you see a threaded barrel? Nope. Also, he should try firing a gun inside of a building and have someone be outside of it and see how loud it is. Walls disperse sound better than you could imagine. And he says, add a couch and windows and insulation and many other obstacles. And you're talking about a 70 to 90 decibel reduction just being in the basement, let alone in another house. This has always been kind of the question, but um, why people didn't hear the guns, why they didn't hear the weapon fire. So many shots, right? Six, seven shots that weren't heard. So um, this is his explanation. This is Mason Hendricks' explanation for it. He just, he says, this is on Sunday, May 28th. He says, honestly, I'll chat some on the phone, but I have no desire to have a video recording. Doesn't want to do a video recording. But then he switches gears to the silencer and is talking about Dan Hannon. So he's obviously watching, obviously um, looking at what we're, we're doing, what we're talking about, what we're, um, you know, and he may even have access. This is before Eric Nelson's film came out, which is why I asked him if he was under any, you know, if he couldn't talk about it or whatever, and he made it clear that he could. He just pretty much didn't want to, and didn't want to do a live recording or anything like that. And anyone who has watched the recording I did with Judy, I can't, I can't blame him or anybody else for not wanting to do something like that, because she got destroyed. Um, and that's being generous. That's being nice. But then he go, you know, he's talking about this, the silencer. So it's, it's always like these one things that kind of gravitate towards to, well, the silencer, the silencer, they had to use a, a silencer and, and it's like, okay, maybe they did, maybe they, they didn't, but it's just interesting. I'm always curious what people focus on. The people who believe David Crowley did this, I'm always very curious about what they focus on and what they don't focus on and then why. So anyways, may not be too important to some people. Um, but he wants to talk about that. And it seems like he knows a lot about you know sounds, the way that he's talking. Walls disperse sounds better than you could imagine. Add a couch and a window and insulation, and many other obstacles. You're talking about a 70 to 90 decibel reduction just being in the basement, let alone in another house. So he's talking about why, we're talking about why the neighbors didn't hear all of these gunshots. What could be the possible explanation? Um, even with the silencer, you would probably still hear something, but it is kind of curious that nobody heard, you know, only one neighbor heard what he thought might have been gunshots. And that is sometime between Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and maybe New Year's, and that's it. That's it. And only three, only three of however many shots there were supposed to be. Pretty curious there. Then on May 30th, this is what I, this is what I asked him, this is what I said, because we had talked about doing some type of show or some something, and so I said on Tuesday, May 30th. You did state before you would do a show after the documentary came out. I'm not sure if Dan or you have fired a gun in a house, but I have, and it was a smaller, less powerful one, and yes, it was heard outside. There are so many factors to firing a gun inside. Yeah, my gun, it was, like, it was a 22 Ruger, very small, very small gun. There are so many factors to firing a gun inside, including time of day, windows insulation, etc., where in the house it was fired, how loud the kids were playing the music next door, etc. So still, I think a gun could have been shot in that house without anyone hearing it or recognizing what they actually heard. So I'm 50-50 on, on that one. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep an open mind on um, all these things because sometimes you hear noises and you're not sure if it's a gunshot, you're not sure if it's fireworks, you're not sure if it's something else. 
Um, and if you're not regularly, if you don't regularly um, hear gunshots, it also makes it difficult. You know, it's like you can't be an expert or anything. You may have heard what sounded like a gunshot. You may have heard a gunshot and it sounded like fireworks, firecrackers. So it's kind of, I'm kind of indifferent on, on that one. But it's just weird how Mason Hendricks, you know, constantly wants to try to discredit um, certain points uh, that Dan Hinnon makes and other, other people make, but never really goes to the length of saying, look, guys, here's what proves David Crowley guilty, which is all we've asked for. What proves David Crowley guilty? That's it. All right, so Mason Hendricks also says, I listened to part of yours and Dan's chat today, and I see the alt-right thing pisses you off as much as me. If you want, I'll explain why that push is being used, and it's kind of fucked up. So even he's kind of getting um, frustrated with the whole alt-right thing where they're trying to label David as this alt-right person. It's like, where does this alt-right thing come from? And um, I said, absolutely, bro, thank you. I feel like there's something I'm missing. And yeah, it feels like there really is something I'm, I'm missing of why they would, why the big narrative has to be that David is part of this alt-right. And he says it goes deep. Uh, he says the media is a powerful, decisive cunt. Hard to argue with that one. <laughs> there was another thing that I asked Mason Hendricks about during our text messages, back going back and forth. And um, I told him, um, I'd like to have a pastor come and bless the Crowley house. Uh, I, I said, did you get a strange feeling when you were in the house after these deaths? I'm wondering if there is an evil spirit still there. And I do wonder that if there is some type of an evil spirit that is in that house that is, um, it may not even be in that house. It may have been in multiple houses with this family, I think. The more that I look at it, oh, the more that I think about it, I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, dandelion little seed there. Go on, seed. Came right up to me. Pretty interesting. <laughs> but I am very curious about the paranormal aspect of this whole case. And so um, people who have been in that house, I'm always curious to see if you feel anything. Did you get any weird feeling? And even in the haunted houses, you're not going to get a weird feeling all of the time as soon as you step in. But there are some occasions and there are some people in certain houses that will feel something, some type of a presence. But when it comes to the Crowleys, I don't feel like they walked into a house that had a presence in it. I feel like there was a presence that was following them. I don't know where that started, how far back, which side of the family it goes back to or anything like that. Lots of good theories. I uh, have a lot of different thoughts on that. But I always try to ask people about what they think about that. What do you think about the paranormal aspect of this case? And I asked Mason Hendricks that, what he thought, and did he get a weird feeling? Um, and he says, and the feeling in that house is beyond strange. It's very uncomfortable. And when you're in it, all you get is a feeling of rage and anger, and it's really odd. That's his answer there from a text message 